A quorum is present. The hearing of the Subcommittee on Workforce Protection will come to order. And I will uh, begin with my opening remarks and then I will yield to my ranking member. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's sort of the end of the school year around here. Everybody's excited and forgetting to come to their committee meeting yet, but they will all be, they will be here. I'm assured of that. Um, and I thank you because this is more important to you than our, our getting away out of here for, for uh, the next few months. I've called this hearing today on the Department of Labor's proposed risk assessment regulation because, quite frankly, I'm troubled by the agency's attempt to rush through this rule without a full consideration of its effect on the health and safety of the American worker. This proposed rule has, without explanation, leapfrogged ahead of many other worker protection standards that OSHA should have been working on for the last eight years, including a standard for diacetyl, the long-delayed silica standard, the long-delayed beryllium standard, and the long-delayed crane standard. By now, most of you know why the proposed rule has been dubbed the secret rule. That's what we call it around here, and now it's become the name of the rule. Because uh, the secret rule was developed by DOL's uh, Office of Policy with little input from anyone, not even its own experts, at OSHA and MSHA. And according to documents recently provided by the committee throughout the process, a DOL consulted with only one outsider during its consideration of the proposal. This was a lawyer representing industry. When the Secretary's office finally showed the rule to its own experts at OSHA and MCHA, those experts disapproved the rule and urged DOL not to proceed. But the DOL policy department ignored their input, pushed ahead anyway. The department was so determined to put this rule in place that it even ignored a deadline set by White House Chief of Staff John Bolton. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chief Bolton prohibited all agencies from proposing regulations after June the 1st, 2008, except in extraordinary circumstances. I'm hoping that Mr. Sequera is prepared to explain to us why extraordinary circumstances exist uh, to justify this rule. Now, it's important to note that this proposed rule, developed in, in secret, we're going to say this many times today, was only brought to the public's attention in early July when the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, uh, which reviews all proposed rules, posted the rule on its website. Actually, it did not post the rule. It only posted the title. Aha. Secret. And so Chairman Miller and Senator Kennedy wrote to DOL and asked for specific information on the rule and how it came about. But no documents were forthcoming until the day before the rule was published in the Federal Register on August the 29th. So many of us have spent the summer scratching our heads about the content of the proposed rule. Now we have the really bad news. Only 30 days to com comment on this misguided proposal. Only 30 days to comment on a risk assessment regulation that would significantly lengthen the many years that it currently takes to issue standards. And only 30 days to comment on a regulation that will significantly affect the ability of OSHA and MSHA to protect workers from deadly health hazards. In addition, DOL has decided not to provide an opportunity for a public hearing. This is unprecedented in the history of significant OSHA and MSHA standards. We have a chart uh, up there on the screen which shows the usual procedures DOL has chosen to ignore in quickly push pushing through this proposed regulation. These uh, procedures as you can see, include Executive Order 12866, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, the Administrative Procedure Act, the OSHA Act, the Mine Safety and Health Act, and the Bolton Memo. Chairman Miller and Senator Kennedy and Senator Murray and I have recently sent a letter to DOL 
asking for a public hearing and for an extension of the comment period. And other groups have done so as well. I hope that the Assistant Secretary will have some good news for us on that front. Of course, the irony of all of this is that during the entire Bush administration, OSHA has not issued a single new health standard except for one that was issued under a court-ordered deadline. And MSHA has issued only one new health standard, and that was on asbestos that belatedly brought the mine standard up to the level that other American workers have enjoyed for over 20 years. In April 2007, this subcommittee had a hearing on OSHA's failure to issue standards. And a young man, Eric Peoples, who is a former worker in the popcorn factory, testi testified about his losing struggle with the popcorn lung disease caused by his exposure to diacetyl, a, a chemical that's used in the microwave popcorn manufacturing process. Sitting beside Eric at the hearing was OSHA Administrator Ed Folk, who assured us that the agency was fully committed to achieving its regulatory goals. Following the April 2007 hearing, many of us concluded that OSHA intended to take no action to prevent workers from exposure to diacetyl. And so I introduced legislation that would require OSHA to issue an interim standard within 90 days and a final standard within no less than two years. As we are about to vote on the bill, which passed in the House, OSHA announced that it would begin rulemaking and shortly thereafter promised to have a draft ready for small business review by January 2008. But here we are, September, with no draft of a standard for diacetyl, but we have the secret rule, which is being propelled forward at lightning speed. Sadly, we know where this administration's priorities are and they are not with the American people. Our witness will further explain this secret rule, we hope, and we look forward to hearing all of our witnesses' testimony. With that, I defer to Ranking Member Joe Wilson for his opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Woolsey, and thank you for recognizing me. I want to thank you for holding this hearing today and thank our witnesses for taking the time to appear before us. Today is Constitution Day. It is only right that we have a hearing ensuring that citizens are able to redress their government. I hope we will all take a few moments today to reflect on the importance of this document to our lives. On August 29, 2008, the Department of Labor formally proposed to change its internal risk assessment policy and provided that proposal for stakeholder input. Prior to this action, however, there was an unnecessary conflict over so-called secret rulemaking to include the chairman of this committee introducing legislation to halt a draft proposal leaked to the Washington Post. The department should be commended for subjecting internal policy to outside scrutiny when it simply could have changed the policy without any notice. That, ladies and gentlemen, would have actually been secret rulemaking. While I will not prejudge the outcome of this rulemaking, I will say that I support the concept of greater transparency in the rulemaking process. The Department's risk assessment proposal will require an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, ANPRM, and so here we go, another acronym, Madam Chairwoman, for us to learn, in order for all stakeholders to provide input during the regulatory process. This will ensure that all of the studies used as a foundation for rulemaking are available for review and I hope will serve to improve rulemaking in the future. I welcome our witnesses today and look forward to a discussion on how to improve the use of risk assessment in federal reg regulations. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Without objection, all members will have 14 days to submit additional material for the hearing record. Now I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel of witnesses uh, that are with us today. And um, I will read their biographies in the order that they will present. And then uh, after the biographies, we'll get started. But let's talk about the lighting system, which is not new to any of you up there, I don't, I believe. But uh, we have a lighting system that is uh, 
of the five minute rule. Everyone, including members, is limited to five minutes of presentation or questioning. The green light is illuminated when you begin to speak. The yellow light uh, goes on when you have a minute left, and when the red light turns on in front of you, you each have your own little lighting system, you'll know that it is time to wrap up or conclude. Now we don't uh, you know, open the, the floor and you drop through it, the red light, but we do uh, know that that's about time to end. And the, the same thing goes for the members up here. If we choose to use our whole five minutes making a speech, then there's no time left to ask questions. So we'll, we'll uh, go from there. So for, let me introduce all of you. Uh, Leon Sequera, Assistant Secretary for Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor, a position he has held since February of last year. He previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Policy at DOL and as counsel to the Senate Rules Committee. Mr. Sequera holds a bachelor's degree from Northwest Missouri State University and a JD from the George Washington University. Celeste Monfortin is a lecturer and researcher at the University, no, no, at the George Washington University School of Public Health. Dr. Monfortin worked at OSHA from 1991 to 1995 as a policy analyst and an MSHA, and at MSHA as a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Labor from 1996 to 2001. She earned her Master's of Public Health in 2004 and her Doctorate of Public Health in 2008 from George Washington School of Public Health. Randall Johnson is Vice President for Labor, Immigration, and Employee Benefits at the U.S. Chamber of Cong Congress, Commerce. Before joining the Chamber, Mr. Johnson was the Republican Labor Council and Coordinator for the Full Education and Labor Committee here in the House. He is a graduate of Denison University and the Mar Maryland University School of Law and received his Master's of Law in labor relations from the Georgetown University Law Center. Margaret Seminario is the Director of Occupational Health and Safety for the AFL-CIO, where she has worked since 1977. Ms. Seminario has directed the organization's efforts on safety and health since 1990. She served on the National Advisory Committee on Occupational Safety and Health and was trained as industrial hygienist at Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, we will now begin with you, Mr. Secretary. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Labor's recent notice of proposed rulemaking regarding our internal procedures for conducting rulemakings that involve the regulation of potential workplace exposure to toxins. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today to offer some facts about the department's proposal, uh, especially given the widespread inaccurate speculation and misleading descriptions of this rulemaking. The department's proposed rule is short and simple. It codifies existing best practices into a single, easy to reference regulation and includes two provisions to establish consistent procedures that promote greater public input and awareness of the department's health rulemakings. Specifically, those provisions are one, the issuance of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking as part of the health standard rulemaking involving the regulation of workplace toxins, and two, the electronic posting of all documents the department relies upon when developing these health standards. It's important to note, contrary to many misleading reports, that this proposal does not affect the substance or methodology of risk assessments, and it does not weaken any health standard. Much of the criticism of this proposal appears to reflect either a profound misunderstanding of the federal rulemaking process or a deliberate mischaracterization of the department's proposal. The department's use of an advance notice of proposed rulemaking is not new. In fact, OSHA frequently issues an advance notice of proposed rulemaking when regulating workplace exposure to toxins, and it has done so since the early 1970s. In fact, several of the recent health standards, uh, health standards most recently issued by the department began with an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. So those who would suggest that this is some sort of unheard of new process are being, well, at the very least, disingenuous. Currently, the department does not have a comprehensive regulation or guidance governing our procedures for conducting rulemakings 
that involve the regulation of workplace toxins. That topic has long been discussed within the department, within the federal government, and among public stakeholders. Specifically, the Clinton era bipartisan presidential and congressional Commission on Risk Assessment and Risk Management thoroughly studied federal risk assessment and management policies. In its 1997 final report, that bipartisan Commission on Risk made specific findings with respect to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. In particular, it found, and I quote, OSHA seems to have relied upon a case-by-case -case approach for performing risk assessment and risk characterization. The Commission further recommended that the agency publish and describe its scientific and policy defaults with regard to risk assessment and risk characterization in support of risk management. Finally, let me say the Department's proposal was developed with a full participation of numerous career professionals within several agencies in the Department, including all experts with knowledge on this topic. The Department believes it's critical that the process for regulating workplace exposure to toxins is fully transparent and accountable to the public, and that's what this proposal seeks to do. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I'll be happy to answer questions from the subcommittee. Thank you, Dr. Monfortin. Chairwoman Woolsey and Ranking Member Wilson and other members of the subcommittee. I'm Celeste Monfortin, a researcher at the George Washington University School of Public Health, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and ask that my full statement be made part of the record. On its face, I understand how some individuals might ask, who could be against the Labor Department having requirements for risk assessment? Or others might wonder why a large group of health scientists and the American Public Health Association urge the Secretary to withdraw this proposal. Here's the problem. Our nation's system for protecting workers from harmful substances that causes injury and illnesses is paralyzed. Thousands of workers are exposed every day to chemical compounds and physical hazards that are known to be harmful. Yet these exposures are permitted by outdated and non-existent OSHA and MSHA standards. As the former chairman of this subcommittee, the late Congressman Norwood acknowledged, there are many occupational health standards that need to be updated in order to achieve safe and healthful workplaces. The public health and worker rights communities would have welcomed a Department of Labor effort to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the rulemaking process. The OSH Act and Mine Act are robust, well-crafted statutes that give broad authority to the Secretary to regulate workers' exposure to toxic materials, and both were clearly grounded in the public health principle of prevention. The overarching goal of both statutes was to identify, mitigate, and or control hazards before they cause harm. But instead of being motivated by prevention, the Labor Department is sponsoring changes that will make it more difficult to issue health protective rules. And the longer workers are exposed to harmful levels of toxic materials, the greater the risk of harm. In the simplest terms, conducting a risk assessment means using the best information available to describe or estimate the risk of an adverse event. A risk assessment is a decision-making tool that allows users to make informed decisions. In the context of occupational health standards, a risk assessment is prepared by OSHA to determine if exposure to a toxic material poses a significant risk to workers. If the hazard does not pose a significant risk, the agency does not have the authority to regulate it. Since the 1980s, when the Labor Department began preparing quantitative risk assessments, the agency's products have consistently withstood vigorous scientific and public scrutiny and legal challenges. No matter the contaminant, asbestos, vinyl chloride, lead, diesel particulate, the assessments were based on the best available evidence and determined with little room for doubt that the levels of exposures experienced by workers placed them at a significant risk of material impairment of health or functional capacity. Furthermore, these risk assessments are not the only factors used in OSHA and MSHA regulatory decisions. The agencies must also conduct analyses to determine if a proposed regulation is economically and technologically feasible. This means that even if the agency's risk assessment for chemical X suggests that an exposure limit should be set at Y in order to protect workers' health, the agency is required to set the exposure limit at a level that's feasible. This means that a final exposure limit might be set at Y times 2 or Y times 5, even when the risk assessment suggested a much lower level was warranted. 
In my written statement, I outline a number of problems with the department's proposed rule, including its misreading of the 1997 commission report, the way it says it values public input but fails to allow adequate time for it, and its incomplete appraisal of key documents that already exist in the department for standard setting and risk assessment. In my remaining time, however, I'd like to draw your attention to the pitfall of preparing a proposed rule on risk assessment in haste and without the benefit of experienced career federal employees in the department. Just last year, a panel of scientists for the National Academies offered a harsh critique of a comparable effort by OMB, and the NAS made specific recommendations for administrative agencies for the content of and procedures for developing risk assessment guidelines. The Labor Department ignores the NAS report in numerous respects, including the recommendation that any proposed guidance draw on expertise in federal agencies and be subjected to peer review. Curiously, the department indicates that, quote, it does not have comprehensive regulations or formal internal guidance outlining consistent risk assessment procedures, end quote. Yet in 2002, it issued a special appendix under its information quality guidelines, which specifically described the procedures to be used by OSHA and MSHA when conducting risk analyses for health and safety rules. The Labor Department's proposal is a sloppy piece of work that will impede, not improve, health protections for workers. It's imperative that this committee use its oversight role to ensure that the promise of the OSH Act and the Mine Act are upheld for the sake of our nation's working people. These are the men and women who create the wealth for our businesses and for our entire economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let, let me try and put this a little bit in context. Before I joined the committee, where I did work for 10 years, I also worked uh, handling many OSHA regulations at the Department of Labor, including... Uh, yeah, Mr. Johnson, a little closer. Oh, let's, let's, let's turn the tape back there so I get my time back. But uh, I'm sorry. Um, before joining the committee, where I did work for 10 years, Madam Chairwoman, I did spend some time at OSHA working on many rulemakings, including benzene, formaldehyde, non asbestiform trimolite, uh, the permissible exposure limit project, uh, which was a personal uh, disappointment where we did regulate 438 chemicals in a, in a very swift rulemaking over seven months. Unfortunately, the court struck that down. I think we could have done that, however, if we had taken four or five more months and done it properly. Uh, but I have, have some experience in this area, although I admit to be a generalist. Uh, but this rulemaking needs to be put in the context of, look, this is an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. There is going to be ample time for the public and other experts to comment on this. It will then become a notice of proposed rulemaking be before it becomes a final rule. Now, I use the rule loosely here because I know the agency is not formally calling this a rule under the Administrative Procedure Act, but it's an agency action. I still believe it would be challengeable in court in, in one way or another, although the DOL Solicitor's Office may disagree with me on that. Uh, but there is a check and balance built into this. Secondly, there's nothing secret about this going on. It's an, an, it's an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. What could be more open? Uh, third, I think it's important to note that the courts recognize that must, much deference must be given to OSHA once it determines what a significant risk is. And I, don't, I can quote from the court cases, you can look at the benzene decision and, and other cases. The point is, is this is not a math, the courts do not hold OSHA to a mathematical straitjacket. Once OSHA makes a decision as to, to a risk of hazard, the courts will defer to that, absent uh, as long as it's supported by substantial evidence. So it's important to get that initial risk assessment uh, right the first time out. An advance notice of proposed rulemaking allows the experts and OSHA to, uh, to sort through the weeds and the long grass before it gets to an NPRM. And, and what can be wrong with that? Um, so, and let me come back to the question of notice. I mean, and, and, and the 30-day comment period, Madam Chairwoman, which you hit on. Uh, frankly, 30 days is a short period of time. Uh, however, uh, there are certainly many times in the history of OSHA where it has used uh, that kind of a time period for, for, uh, for even more significant regulations. Uh, for example, I'm holding up here the proposed regulation on ergonomics, which was issued in November 23, 1999, Thanksgiving week, in which we had 60 days to comment on it with 800 pages of, of, of regulations, which is right here, as comparative to this regulation, which is about six pages. Now, we did ask the Clinton administration for a 30-day extension, which we got after selling our firstborn, uh, but uh, that was a massive piece of rulemaking stretching over many, many issues, many pages. This is six or seven pages. So maybe 30 days is not enough. Maybe the department will give another 30 days. I'm not sure. The point is, is it can be done. People can focus on it, and it's just an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. 
Uh, lastly, I think, you know, if a final rule comes out and it's not to this, the satisfaction of this committee, Congress always has oversight powers to rein in uh, an agency that's gone too far. And who knows what might happen in the next election. But I think the proper role for the committee might be to look at this when it becomes out as a final rule rather than to be interfering with the agency process now, which, of course, the Administrative Procedure Act and the OSHA rulemaking process contemplated that the agency would apply its expertise, that's why it's created, uh, before Congress steps in. Uh, so, you know, with regard to transparency, posting things on the Internet, duh. I mean, of course those kinds of things can be done. I can say in the past, such as ergonomics, the agency failed to, uh, failed to do several of those things, which is why we certainly support this regulation. Key studies were left out. We had to send law clerks over to the Department of Labor. I believe Senator Enzi had to go over there and go through the rulemaking record to find the studies we needed. Uh, so posted it on the Internet, what could be wrong with that? Uh, it should, certainly should be done, hopefully, at the same time that the NPRM is posted and not, not two weeks into that. Um, and I think I'll just, these, these are, these, these, there will be lots of time to sort through these issues. Um, I think it's a rulemaking that needs to be done. Uh, the, the process of a risk assessment down at OSHA is confusing. I met, I don't know, I don't know less about MSHA, but this is just trying to pull it together in one useful document for the public to look at. Uh, is it a tempest in a teapot? I'm not sure it's more important than that, but uh, I think it's something that's perhaps been blown out of proportion. Uh, nevertheless, I appreciate this opportunity to testify, and, and hopefully we will, we will all comment seriously on this proposal that becomes a final rule. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. I think you heard the bells ring. We're going to have three votes. So, uh, uh, Ms. Seminario, if you will complete, and then we we're going to try to have uh, a series of questions up here because we really have 20 minutes. We know that. It says 13, but we know how it works, the first vote. So we'll, let's complete the witnesses, and then we'll ask some questions. The chairman runs very fast. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Peg Seminario. I'm Safety and Health Director uh, for the AFL-CIO, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to testify today. Um, I've been doing this work for over 30 years and have worked on virtually every major rule that has come through the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, on August 29th, just before Labor Day, the Department of Labor published a proposed rule in the Federal Register imposing new requirements on OSHA and MSHA for conducting occupational risk assessments in developing health rules. Um, it's our view that it's actually a proposed rule, unlike uh, what Mr. Johnson said. He thinks it's an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which are indeed are different, so getting some clarification on that would be uh, helpful. Uh, this new rule was developed in secret uh, without any consultation by political appointees in the Office of Assistant Secretary of Policy during the last months of the Bush administration. Uh, in our view, it would significantly delay and potentially weaken future occupational health protections. Um, we are greatly concerned uh, seeing this rule being pushed through by an administration that unfortunately for the past seven and a half years has refused and has failed to set any new OSHA health rules to protect workers. Uh, now the administration is rushing to lock in place requirements to make it more difficult for the next administration uh, to act to protect workers from known health risks. Uh, in our view, the De uh, Department of Labor Risk Assessment Rule is unnecessary and unsound. According to the department, the purpose of the rule is to compile its existing best practices related to risk assessment into a single easy to re reference regulation. But as noted above and explained in greater detail in my written testimony, uh, the rule does more than codify existing practices. It changes existing practices and does impose new burdens on both OSHA and MSHA. Um, we believe that the rule is unnecessary. Uh, as Dr. Monfortin pointed out, uh, OSHA has conducted risk assessments for years, and those risk assessments uh, have been re very robust. Then they have withstood court challenges and have found to be sound. Uh, we also believe that the rule is inappropriate. The department already has risk assessment guidelines that were adopted in 2002. But guidance is meant to be just that, guidance which is non-mandatory, a flexible directive that can be changed. Indeed, when you look across the government, everything that has been done on risk assessment, including uh, those directives out of OMB, are done as guidance. This is different. It is codifying these procedures in the federal register. And with that, the administration is attempting to impose its policies on the next administration. 
Uh, we don't see that in the next four months this administration is going to issue any new rules. They haven't done so to date. So what is the purpose of this rather than putting in place its views, its policies on the next administration? Uh, we think that the rule will add years of delay to both OSHA and MSHA rulemakings, uh, and with that, <coughs> it will put workers at risk. It adds a new step, the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, to the rulemaking process. Uh, indeed, in some cases, OSHA has used ANPRs, but they use other procedures for gathering information as well. They have advisory committees. They have requests for information. They may conduct um, uh, public meetings. This proposal would lock in this one particular procedure rather than leaving it to the uh, discretion and judgment of the agencies as to how to proceed. And it changes the rulemaking procedures that are set forth in the Occupational Safety and Health Act and Mine Safety and Health Act, and essentially it attempts to amend um, those rules. So we don't think this one method should be imposed in a one-size-fits-all when rules differ and the uh, mechanisms for gathering information and what's appropriate uh, should, be, uh, should be flexible. Um, it's important to point out, or worth pointing out, because of such delays that ANPRs bring uh, to rulemaking, and we estimate it'll be about two years of additional time, that in 1987, the Administrative Conference uh, suggested and recommended that OSHA not use uh, ANPRs. Um, it's important to point out this delay has real impact on workers. Uh, the proposal doesn't apply only to future rules, it applies to those in process as well. We have three important health rules moving along at OSHA, one on silica, one on beryllium, another on diacetyl. None of those have had an ANPR, not one. They've had other ways of gathering the information. This rule requires that OSHA go back to square one and start all over. You know, it's, silica's been in, in under development for, for 10 years, beryllium the same, and this will result in dozens and dozens of unnecessary deaths. Um, so in conclusion, let me just say that this proposal is flawed, it is unnecessary, it is unsound, and it will harm the health of workers in this country. It should be withdrawn by the Department of Labor, and if it is not, we would uh, highly support efforts by the Congress to stop it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, yield to Mr. Payne. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just be brief since we are going to have to leave. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Mr. Sakara, um, this proposal um, we're talking about has, uh, has not been peer reviewed. Uh, why did uh, your office disre disregard uh, the recommendation from the National Academies made in 2007, which states that technical guidance developed by agencies should be peer reviewed? The department's proposal is not required to be peer reviewed. The, the uh, proposed rulemaking and what we're seeking comment on is not technical and is not guidance and therefore is not subject to peer review. Okay, therefore, because it's not subject to peer review, therefore, um, you discount the fact that, you know, that it should be. I mean, uh, your answer is that it's not required, therefore, a lot of things weren't required. That's why uh, AIG had to get $85 billion from the government yesterday. You know, things that are required and not required as opposed to what should be done to prevent things from happening is what we're concerned about. And there seems to be a nonchalant sort of cavalier attitude by the Department of Labor that these things are uh, not required. Therefore, uh, it's like water off a duck's back. Well, Congressman, as I understand it, the process of peer review applies to technical information, studies, reports, in the academic sense that articles are peer reviewed. Uh, this proposal, the department's proposal, doesn't represent anything of that kind. I'm not sure what there is in the proposal to be peer reviewed, frankly. Okay, uh, would any of the other witnesses like to express their point of view? Yes, Ms. Uh, Doctor. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, the, your question is excellent in terms of the requirement for peer review. Yes, it's not a requirement, but the Department of Labor says over and over again that this is something about best practices. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anyone here that would suggest that recommendations coming out of the National Academies would not be considered best practices. Mm -hmm. And the National Academy specifically said that any risk assessment guidance document prepared by the administration should meet certain criteria and mm -hmm. it should be subject to peer review. Yes. Uh, I would just uh, um, support what Dr. Monforton has said. Um, the department can't have it both ways. They can't be proposing by rule to make law certain, they say existing best practices, but some changes in practices. Say that on the one hand, um, but on the other hand say that it shouldn't be peer reviewed or they don't need public comment on it. They also shouldn't be saying, quite frankly, when they're attempting to change the way standards are set in the standard setting process, change the Administrative Procedures Act, change the Occupational Safety and Health Act and Mine Safety and Health Act requirements for how you set rules. Both those laws say you issue a proposal and then you issue a final. Both of them also provide for advisory committees. And suddenly, lo and behold, we have a whole new proposal to say we have a whole new formal step for every occupational health rule. You can't do that and say that, no, we don't think we should take public comment, or no, we don't think that peer review is needed. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Yes. I just, normally, the employer community is very strong supporters of, of peer reviewed studies, and, and we certainly would join with the unions here on. on requiring peer review studies generally in, in OSHA standard setting processes if they're so important here. Uh, I think whether or not they had to be done here, I think your point is perhaps it should have been done. I'm not quite sure on the legal requirements in this proposal. It appears to be not the kind of, of methodological studies that are normally subject to a peer review process, but I'm, but I'm not quite sure. I, I, with, with regard to, to, to Peg Seminaro's, this changes the rulemaking process. Look, an ANPRM is, an, is not recognized under the Administrative Procedure Act. That's true or the rulemaking process under OSHA. However, the APA has not been amended since 1940, well, in this area since 1947. The OSHA Act has not been amended since 1972. Surely there's some room for some novelty and, 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 and reflection in terms of improving the rulemaking process in those 40 years. Uh, the AMPRMs are commonly used by agencies. They're not some strange creature. And they can be used quickly by agencies to clear out the underlying brush and move quickly to an NPRM. What agencies often do, unfortunately, is use AMPRMs as an excuse to get their, their political uh, overseers on Capitol Hill off their backs or the courts. And that's unfortunate, but it's used by both Republican and Democrat administrations. If they're not used as an excuse and they're used as good faith mechanisms to get to the, the conclusions quickly and allow public comment, then they're very useful. But they shouldn't be used as a shield, I, which is a problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Uh, the ranking member and I will be back after the votes. Uh, and. Uh, I'll try to get the rest of our committee back up here, too. All right. So hang on. We'll be back. Yeah, no, you got that right. So, 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 so,